is moving and he is at work. Praise God. Now, at this time, um, I'm going to ask uh, Jamie and Diana Hux to help me. And uh, um, yeah, come on up. And um, Diana, of course, you guys know me, Andy Rudd, and my wife, Jamie. And Diana Hux, Diana is over our children's program and also a teacher in the school and very involved in what God is doing in the kids here. And we'll th- we're thankful for Diana and all the workers who give themselves to training up a new generation. Amen. And so in a moment, we're going to call uh, the parents and to bring their babies up. And um, But we're just going to do a blessing. And before we do that, though, I want Diana just to admonish. Let's bring them up first, Jamie says. She's the admin. So she gets to call that. So you guys go ahead and come. Amen. So those with babies being dedicated today, if you'll come forward, you can put your children in here. <laughs> Even if you have to just bring them out. Yeah. However you have to get them here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask you guys to come and stand in front of us with your children. Because this is in stand facing us. I mean, I know it's great for them to see you, but we really want to be able to s- to speak into your life and bless you guys and um, admonish you. Because this is really about you guys. This is about these little guys and um, and who they're called to be. And so I'm going to let Diana um, speak for a few minutes and just admonish you guys and bless you. So welcome to the most amazing but challenging moment of your life. Um, As I was thinking about this yesterday, all I can do is compare to what I have been through. And I'm raising five beautiful children, but one thing that I have learned is I can't do it alone. And so, church, tribe, whatever we want to call ourselves, it is a lot of our job because we are going to have a huge influence in these children's life. But also to say to you guys, we have your back. Because I'm telling you, I could not have done it alone. I couldn't have done it without the grandparents. But my church, oh, Jamie is like the second mama to my children. And I'm just like, I, there are just things that I could not carry alone. And so I'm just here to tell you guys, as the children's director, I have your back. And that we just, I just want to bless you guys today. But most importantly, just remember you're not in it alone. And this is going to be the most amazing but challenging, which some of you have already done this. But they're all different, right? Every one of them are different. But I just bless you guys today. in church, just remember that what we do, what we say, will influence their lives and the parents' lives, you know, amazingly. So, I, I hate the term, and I love the tr- term of it takes a tribe. It really does. And, and when we really learn, and I, when I learned to lean into that, that I didn't have to be the perfect mom or the perfect dad, or I could just be who, I mean, because every kid is different, and your every family is different. And what your family needs, we talked about this yesterday, what works for my family may not work every time for her family, and the same for us. We're not the same people, but we are the same tribe. You know, we have the same bloodline. But it doesn't mean we're the exact same person, and we're going to do what we do. And you know what? There are times that I look at people, I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do. Because the mama, you know, some kid parents look at me all the time and say, I have told them that a hundred times. I know, but you're the mom. You know, my kids, the same thing. They need someone else sometimes to say those same things and love them in a different way and, and bring them to. So we're all here together, and you're not alone. And you don't have to be perfect because there is no perfect way except Jesus. And we're all on this journey with you. So never feel alone in all of those things. And we are here as a church. And those who have come, you've come as family to love and to support. And we admonish you as well and say, guess what? You're, you're here to be a part and play a part in these children's lives. So we admonish you as those sitting in these, this room. And we say, you're up. You know, what you do and what you say and the roles you play, they're watching you, and it's vital and it's important. And so we call you up to a whole new level to love and to support and give to not just these babies but to these families. And, and it's, it's so vital and it's so important. And if we would learn this in our culture, other cultures have it. They get it. 
But if we would learn this in America and our culture, it would change our culture. And it would change the pressures that moms and dads feels when they feel when they feel they're alone. You're not alone. Amen. Amen. And I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures and then pray a blessing. And we're just going to very quickly play, lay hands on each one of these kids and bless them. But Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5 says, Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Amen. So you guys are blessed. Your kids are blessed. And, uh, you know, also uh, number six, verses 24 through 26 says, May the Lord bless you and take care of you. And we speak this over the kids. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And so just want to pray this blessing and then we'll lay hands on them. So let's just pray. So, Lord, we thank you for these gifts of life that you've given us. Lord, may you bless each one of them. And God, as we bring them before you, Father, we thank you and we ask for your protection, your guidance, and your provision to be with them always. And Father, may they grow in wisdom and stature with you and with man. Father, I pray that you encounter them all at a young age. Father, that they would be born again quickly, Father God, and that there would be encounters Father God, that you would open the eyes of their heart, that you would open their spiritual eyes and their spiritual ears. Lord, just as, as Samuel heard your voice at a young age, and, and God, just as, as so many in the word experienced you at a young age, God, we just bless them today. Father, may they experience you. Father God, may, they, may you draw them, and may they experience the power of the Spirit, the, the very breath of heaven, the life of God in all of them. So, Father, we just bless them today. Father, we thank you for Nora, and we just bless Nora right now. Father, thank you, Father, that you've called her even from her mother's womb. Lord, we bless what you're doing in Nora. And, Father God, everything in her life, God, Father, may she be dedicated and committed to you and be born again very quickly, Lord. We bless her today yeah and she likes it she's happy about it she finally smiled thank you lord hallelujah father we thank you for jensen father we thank you for jensen's family lord god thank you lord we bless him today father god thank you that even now even at a young age his heart is very open toward you god to experience what you want to show him what you want to reveal to him lord i thank you that um, that he's going to know you at an early age. And, Father, that all throughout his life, he's going to follow you. Jesus, all throughout his life, he's going to pursue you. Lord, just thank you, Lord. I think he likes it too. Amen. He suddenly chilled out. Hallelujah. And the parents love it when that happens, especially when they're standing before everybody in public. Thank you, Lord. We bless Jensen today. Hallelujah. Yeah. Extra for these two. Hallelujah. So, Lord, we just say more, more for Gabriella. Father, we just thank you how even in the early days of, of challenges, God, that you just met her. And, Lord, that you just released healing to her. Lord, I just thank you that she'll walk in health in all of her days, God, and that she'll know you and experience you. Father, we bless her. We bless her family. God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that she's going to uh, just even declare the words of the Lord. Lord, she's going to declare, um, even in song, God, I thank you that she's just going to declare and worship you, uh, Father God, and, and, and bring heaven to earth. So we just bless Gabriella today and her family in Jesus' name. She's happy about it, too. All right. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for Matthew. <laughs> Lord, we bless him today. Lord, thank you. Lord, that uh, we, we just bless him to know you at a very early age and a young age. And Father, I thank you that he's just going to have such courage throughout his life. God, that such courage. Lord, I thank you that you've created him and made him to be a leader. And God, and he's going to lead many and he's going to lead with integrity. Lord, he's going to lead with righteousness. And Father, I just ask for wisdom even now 
God, I thank you that you're going to give him the gift of wisdom, Lord, and that he's going to speak wise words of counsel. And so, Father, we just bless Matthew today. Father, we bless him, his family, his household, Lord, his extended family, his grandparents. Lord, thank you so much for what you're doing in Matthew and Gabriella. Lord, thank you, Lord. Now, as these guys turn and face you, amen. And uh, let's just give thanks to the Lord for what he's done in these guys and what he's going to do. And we have a gift to each of you from Global Harvest. Hallelujah. Amen. So it's a good looking group. Amen. And don't worry, those of you that have other children coming, we will do the same thing at another time. Amen. So praise God. Let's just give them a hand one more time. Hallelujah. All right. So at this time, we are going to uh, let kids go to Children's Church. Amen. And it was good to hear from Miss Diana and Miss Jamie. Hallelujah. And we're thankful for what the Lord is doing in Children's Church. Amen. Good stuff is happening. Hallelujah. So praise God. Well, we welcome you guys this morning. And uh, my message is only an hour, so don't worry. Hey, Jesus was on the cross, what, six hours? Those of you that don't know me are a little nervous, right? Those that do know me are even more nervous, perhaps. Hallelujah. And I do just want to remind us, and I know many of you have probably seen this on Facebook, but be praying for the church in Sri Lanka. Um, Sri Lanka, several churches uh, under experienced bombings on Easter Sunday. And, um, you know, the, the enemy doesn't like what God is doing in the earth. Amen. Many of you realize that God's power and beauty and presence, those things are increasing. And, uh, you know, let's just, when, as God brings that to mind, pray for our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka. Um, Amen. We think we're persecuted in America, and um, we just don't understand the depths of persecution in the earth. Hallelujah. So this morning, hallelujah, we're going to, we're we going to, I, I teach high school English, but we're going to celebrate the resurrection, and uh, man, everything in Christianity revolves around this day. Everything, you know, and if, if, if not for what this day represents, um, we would have no faith, right? And so I want to begin this morning just by reading out of 1 Corinthians 15. Let's turn there together. 1 Corinthians 15. And I want to read this and just follow along. I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture, but I think, I think it's important. Amen. So let's just begin reading in verse 1. Of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, it was Paul writing to the Corinthian church. Uh, he said, Now, let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had, been mo had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time most of them who are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him, for I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy be to, to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted the church. Now let's skip down to verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, 
Why are you some, some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection, resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the dead. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has been not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Amen. Christ has been raised from the dead. Amen. He's a first fruits of what the Lord has done. And, uh, you know, everything, and it's so amazing that everything, uh, the evidence that Jesus is exactly who he said is very real. Amen. And, uh, you know, and I, I want to talk this morning about the, the, the resurrection. I can't think of a better thing to talk about on Easter Sunday, amen, Resurrection Sunday, and you know, Jesus, there, there's no one like Jesus, there, there's no other religious leader, political leader in history who ever made the claims that Jesus made, when he's, he said, guess what, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be crucified, I'm going to be resurrected on the third day, Muhammad never said that. Confucius never said that, right? There's no leader that ever made those claims. There's no leader in history that had has fulfilled over 500 uh, prophetic scriptures that were made about his birth, his life, and his death. Many that he fulfilled in one day when he was crucified. Amen. And, uh, you know, there, there's great evidence. Some people will say, well, you know... Um, Jesus was just a historical figure, or Jesus, he was a good man, he was a teacher, uh, but he was never resurrected from the dead, right? Well, there's great evidence that says that is not true, and I think the greatest evidence of all is the resurrection, amen? So let's talk about the resurrection this morning, and uh you know, there, there are some, even in communist countries in the past, when you, when you looked at history, um, they basically said that Jesus was a mythological figure who never existed, okay? Um, but that is not true. He is alive, and he's risen from the dead. And, you know, somebody have even offered um, theories like to, to, to try to disprove his resurrection that he actually did. Even though he was on the cross, he didn't die on the cross. Now, let's think about that for a minute. There's a lot of scriptural and historical evidence that that is not true. Okay? I'm going to read out of John 19, 33 and 34, and just listen for a moment. Okay? It says, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, a spear, and at once there came out blood and water, okay? So let's talk about this for a minute. If, if somehow, through some possibility, that Jesus was survived the crucifixion. So think about this. He had undergone a flogging, a Roman flogging, most of which most people who underwent that, they didn't even survive. The, the flesh was ripped off their body, uh, that many died from that and didn't even get to the point where they were crucified on a cross. But Jesus did. He was nailed to a cross for six hours. And, uh, you know, and if he actually survived the flogging, if he actually survived the crucifixion, the idea that he could be put in a tomb and push away a rock that weighed probably a ton and a half is quite ridiculous, right? Um, some of us are in, well, I'm looking around. I don't know that any of us are in great shape. Just kidding, right? 
<laughs> Even some of us in better shape probably couldn't have pushed away a, a stone weighing a ton and a half, right? Now, the soldiers were obviously convinced he was dead. And um, if they allowed a prisoner to escape as a Roman guard, they would also have experienced execution. Right? On top of that, we just read where Jesus' side was pierced. And it says that blood and water flowed. Now, that's an interesting thing to read, that blood and water flowed. And, you know, medically, and I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, but from what I understand, that once you die in the blood, the blood separates into clot and serum, okay? And so as John wrote this account, he had no idea that that was medically true, but he wrote that blood and water flowed out of Jesus' side. There was, medic there was medical evidence in the Bible from people who did not understand medical evidence that Jesus was dead, okay? So, there's proof that he did die, okay? Now, what about other theories saying that he didn't rise? One theory is that um, his disciples stole his body, okay? Uh, now, let's think about that for a minute. We, we mentioned already that the tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers, okay? And it is psychologically improbable that the disciples who followed Jesus stole Jesus' body. Because, let's think about this, when, when they came for Jesus, the disciples scattered. And you know, sometimes we read scripture and we think, man, if I was there, I would have stood by him. But I don't know that we would have. Especially believing that it was over. You ever had a moment when you thought, when you realized that something was over, one phase of your life, and maybe it's not good? <laughs> right? The disillusionment, the discouragement, the depression. These guys ran, and only some of the women and John stayed at, the si at his side in the crucifixion. Now, you know, we think women were braver, and women are brave, but many of the reasons that the women stuck around is because they were not a threat. And the disciples allowed them, the, the Roman authorities allowed them to stay. And even John himself was a young man. If, if the disciples had been gathered around him, they themselves probably would have all been executed. So why would a group of people who thought everything was over that Jesus was dead and gone, why would they perpetuate a hoax, right? Because we wouldn't do that, right? Today, we wouldn't do those things. We would be doing the exact same thing. We would all be in hiding, right? And, and think about it. We've got Peter who denied Jesus, okay? And, and this is also an evidence of his resurrection, that a man who, who hid who denied Jesus, something happened to Peter between Jesus' death and the day of Pentecost, 40-something days later, where he preached so powerfully through the power of the Holy Spirit that had been poured out that he preached to a crowd where over 3,000 people got saved. You know, it was probably more than that, pre that Peter was just a good preacher but it was probably due to the fact that a large portion of Jerusalem at that time had actually seen Jesus after his resurrection, right? There was proof that he was alive and, preach, and Peter preached by the power of the Holy Spirit. He had been transformed by Jesus' resurrection, amen. The disciples would not have, have stolen the body because they knew they would suffer that even if they could get past the Roman guard, that they would be flogged with the same flogging that Jesus probably went through. They would be tortured, and they themselves would probably be martyred in the same manner that Jesus was. It's incredible proof that something happened. They would not have stolen the body. 
Now, there's also a, a theory for many who want to say that the resurrection didn't happen, that it was the authorities that stole the body, okay? And, uh, you know, now that's just a dumb theory. Because if that were true, if the authorities stole the body, why would they not produce it to prove that Jesus did not raise, rise from the dead? Because when suddenly these rumors start going around, they could have said, uh, look, here he is. He's dead. He was gone, right? He was gone from the grave. And um, I also want to read this. Didn't you guys love that short video at the beginning? Was that so well done? I mean, we watched that in chapel the other day, and I was just like, oh, the joy that came out of Peter and John when they realized he's not here. And there was this, uh, there was this evidence of the grave clothes. Right? Didn't you love how they portrayed that when Peter's like, his clothes are here. And then they're like, oh, he, he's, he's shed them. And I, and I, I want to read this because I think I like how this is written. This is from Josh McDowell. Many of you have heard Josh McDowell. He's a, a, an apologist and he said, grave clothes were like the empty chrysalis of a caterpillar's cocoon when the butterfly has emerged. It was as, as if Jesus had simply passed through the grave clothes. Not surprisingly, John saw and believed. Can you imagine that moment? When you think it's over, everything that you've given your life to in the last three years is done. And then suddenly, these crazy women come telling you. Right? And we joked about this, but you know, isn't it awesome, ladies? that the first people who preached the gospel were women. Freedom to you. <laughs> it was women who came saying, man, we went to the tomb and he's not there. And an angel told us that he was risen and man, the disciples ran. They ran because they thought, what have these ladies been doing? Right. Because, you know, rabbis taught that women were evil. Right? But Jesus did more to bring women as equal citizens into the kingdom. And, and these guys, they ran ahead in the realization that the stone's gone. The guards are gone. We don't know if they were gone, if they were knocked down. Uh, we don't know, you know. But they, they, they saw in that realization that, man, he's just passed through these clothes. They're not here, and, you know, he's not running around naked. <laughs> he's risen from the dead. I want to read this out of John 20, John 20, verses 1 through 9. It's what we saw in the video, but I want to read it. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Hallelujah. 
and other and it, other accounts discuss that they saw that they believed. Amen. Now let's think about this. Other things that proved Jesus' resurrection. Amen. Were his appearance to the disciples. Okay. And we read that earlier in 1 Corinthians. And some people are like, well, they were just hallucinating. All right. Well, people who generally hallucinate, okay, um, often are medicated, mental problems, right? But did this really fit rough fishermen, tax collectors, and skeptics? Like Thomas, right? Skeptics who said, Oh, I don't, unless unless I put my hand in his side where he was pierced by the spear, and unless I see the holes in his hands, I'm not going to believe. Right? I just won't believe. These aren't the type of people that are subject to hallucination, right? And, and not only that, you've got the fact that that Jesus appeared to disciples on 10 different occasions over a period of six weeks. 500 people saw the risen Christ over that time period. The evidence of his resurrection is phenomenal. He wasn't like a ghost, because sometimes people think, well, you know, we still think Jesus is like a ghost. Anybody ever think that, whether it's subconsciously or not? You think that he's just floating in heaven with angels? Right? Sometimes we think that, but he's he was resurrected. He's at the at the right hand of the Father in a physical body. Right? He's brought humanity into the presence of the Father, right? And, And he's there with the marks of covenant that he made for you and me. He's in the presence of the Father. And it says when he was resurrected, he he did things like he ate, right? He could be touched. He told told Thomas, Thomas, go ahead. You said you wouldn't believe, so here it is. And Thomas like, Jesus, I'm okay. Because I wouldn't want to put my hands in there either, right? (laughs) Maybe I would. I don't know. But there was one point even where he cooked breakfast for the disciples. Do you remember that? Where they'd been out and he sat with them on the shore that morning and he cooked breakfast for them and he ate fish. And and the Bible even says over those times when he appeared to them and says in the book of Acts that he taught them many things about the kingdom of God. So Jesus just wasn't showing up going, woo, right? Get a quick glimpse of me. I'm like a Sasquatch, you know. (laughs) But he sat with them, he ate with them, and he actually taught them. Can you imagine what it would be like? Because we just sometimes we, because of traditions and stuff, we don't really read the Bible. Right? Right? But there was, he taught them many things about the kingdom of God. Can you imagine, as one of his disciples, what it was like when you saw him crucified? You saw him flogged. You saw him taken away. And then to sit with him in a resurrected body, and he taught you about the kingdom. What a remarkable thought to have a teaching session with the risen Christ. And he was like, boys and ladies, the kingdom is here. It's yet to come, but yeah, it looks a lot different than you thought it would, was going to look like, but the kingdom's here. It's no wonder that they turned the world Upside down. Because their paradigm completely shifted. And they were willing to lay their lives down. You know, uh, tradition, the Bible doesn't always record it, but church history says that, that uh, you know, we know that they established the church at Jerusalem, and, and history says 
they went and planted churches in many other places. And, and they were all martyred. They were all martyred except for John, who tradition says was boiled in oil. Right? And the crazy thing was, he didn't die. Because right? you know what? God, God wanted to give him a vision so he could write the book of Revelation. And he took him into a heavenly realm. And, and that probably happened when he was on the island of Patmos because they're like, we can't kill him. We, we don't know what to do with him. So let's just throw him out on this island, not a tropical island. He wasn't suffering for Jesus in Hawaii, okay? <laughs> He's probably stuck on a rock. And while he's been left to die, he has this heavenly encounter where the Lord appears to him and says, Hey, John, come up here. Come into this heavenly place because I'm going to show you things. I'm going to reveal things to you. Right? And, and, and he was the one guy who wasn't martyred of the, of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. But something happened that turned these guys upside down. And it was the resurrection. Right? Why would you be willing to die for something that wasn't true? Because right? they weren't making money off of it. They were risking their lives. And they laid their lives down and turned the world upside down. Amen. Now, Another thing that points to the proof of the resurrection was the immediate effect, the tremendous growth of the church. I have a quote here from a guy named Michael Green, who's a, a Bible scholar, and he says, The church, beginning from a handful of uneducated fishermen and tax gatherers, swept across the whole known world in the next 300 years. It is a perfectly amazing story of peaceful revolution that has no parallel in the history of the world. It came about because Christians were able to say to inquirers, Jesus did not only die for you, he is alive. You can meet him and discover for yourself the reality we are talking about. They did and joined the church, and the church, born from that Easter grave, spread everywhere. Right? The church exploded. Amen. It exploded and grew rapidly. And it continues to grow rapidly all over the earth today. There's great revival in the earth. Amen. There's a great growth of revival. The nation of Brazil is in revival. For the first time in my knowledge in Brazilian history, uh, the prime minister and his secretaries worshipped Jesus on Good Friday. Okay. There's a great shifting happening in the nation of Brazil. Uh, some of us have had the opportunity to be there where churches numbering hundreds of thousands are exploding in growth because of what the Holy Spirit is doing, because of what Jesus is doing. There's great growth. There's great things happening, even in spite of persecution in places like Sri Lanka. There's a tremendous growth because of what God's doing. And God's, God's wanting to pour out His Spirit in America. He's looking for people who will believe Him. Amen. I want to read what former Chief Justice of England, Lord Darling. How would you like to be Lord Darling? All right, We might change Jim's name to that or something. Right. I think that's a good name. Here's what he had to say about the resurrection. In its favor as living truth, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in such a verdict that the resurrection story is true. Because there's the reality that 
We ha- we're left with three alternatives about Jesus. Right? First of all, you can't just say he was a great teacher, but he wasn't God. Because either he was the greatest con man who ever lived, right? Or he was a demonic, <laughs> delusional person. Or he was exactly who he said he was. Right? As many times in history we want to say, well, you know, he was a good man. I just can't believe he was God. The resurrection draws a line. It's that either he's who he said he was, or he's a liar, or a con man. But he's alive today. I spoke to him this morning. I heard his voice. Right? He spoke to me. I felt his presence. Right? I felt his presence in worship. I, I, I felt him this morning as we gathered to pray. Right? He's more alive and he's more real. He's not just seated at the right hand of the Father. He's there. But through the power of the Spirit, he's present for you and for me. And he gives us all an invitation to know him. Right? To know him and experience him. C.S. Lewis famous Christian author. Um, Many of us know him from uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote those as allegories of the Christian experience. C.S. Lewis says, we are faced then with a frightening alternative. Either Jesus was and is exactly what he said, or else he was insane or something worse. However strange or electrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Right. The miracle of Easter, that he's risen from the dead, amen, that he's here, that he's present. And it's evidence that demands a verdict. And it's evidence, I know I'm preaching a little bit different than some of you guys are used to, right? This is very much about apologetics and those things. But we we live in a world where many of us think that this is myth, right? And we're more comfortable, and I'm not criticizing these things, we're more comfortable in Easter bunnies and eggs than we are I have no problem with you guys celebrating that, right? Go go for it, right? But there's a reality that the resurrection demands a response from us, right? It demands, and it demands more than just, you know, hey, here I am. I'm in the church, or my grandma taught Sunday school, or I prayed a prayer once, right? It demands that. He's alive. And how can I not but live for Him? All of eternity, right? All of our lives focuses on Him. And it's crazy because He said things like, you know, I love what Bill Johnson says, that Jesus is perfect theology. And He said, He told His disciples, hey, if you've seen the Father, You've seen, if, if you've seen, let me get it right. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Jesus, God in the flesh, painted a picture of what God looked like. If you see what Jesus did, that's what God looks like. It's like the story once where a little girl was drawing a, a picture and uh, the, her mother said, well, what are you drawing? And she said, well, I'm I'm drawing a picture of God. And she said, well, that's silly. No one knows what God looks like. And she said, they will when I'm finished. (laughs) But Jesus painted a picture. A 
of what the Father looked like. And He forgave sin. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out devils. He calmed seas. He multiplied food. Right? He went after the outcast. Right? He went and, and stood between those who were going to be stoned because of sin. He forgave them. He told them to go and sin no more because of grace, because of love. He said, this is what the Father looks like. And he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Right? I'm the bread of life. Isn't that crazy that if I came in today and I told you guys, hey, everybody, I'm the bread of life, you would probably freak out. That would be the weirdest thing. <laughs> and it's like, if you partake of me, you will never hunger and thirst again. That's what Jesus did. Think how radical it was what he did. And may we live from that place of saying, Jesus, I want you. And I want to not just know about you in this season. I want to experience you. Right? I want to experience you every day. I want to hear your voice. I want to live my life from that place because you're risen from the dead. Right? So this morning, right, I challenge you to live your life for him. I challenge you. There's great moves of God coming up on the earth. Right? I believe we're in the beginning stages of a move of God in this city. People who don't even have a paradigm are coming with stories to me about something's happening in this neighborhood. There's something happening. It's, there, there's, there's a presence. There's a glory that's coming. Right? And I believe we're in the greatest moment in history. Amen. And the Lord's giving you an invitation this morning. Amen. So this morning, we're going to dismiss, right? But as we do, right, Sean's going to put on some music. We're going to have some teams up here. If you need healing this morning, we'll have a team to pray for physical healing that'll stand here. This morning, if you need a prophetic word, and, and you know, a prophetic word is where people minister to you, uh, they, they listen for what the Lord is saying and speak that over your life, then there'll be a prophetic team here. But if this morning, if you want to give your life to Jesus, or if you just want to make a commitment of, man, I want to know him more. Right? I want to experience him. I want him in my life. I'm going to be standing here, and I invite you to come. Amen. I invite you to come, and I'm not going to pressure you. We're not going to sing 99 stanzas of a verse. Because I believe if you really want Him, if you really want Him, you'll come. I know most of us here are believers, so I challenge you today. Live in the reality of the resurrection. Live in the reality that he's not in a tomb anymore. Amen. And he's present. Hallelujah. So this morning, let's just pray. We'll dismiss. and You guys can go and enjoy family today. So this morning, Father, I just want to thank you. I thank you today that the tomb is empty. I thank you today that Christ has risen from the grave. Lord, I thank you that Jesus has conquered death, hell, the grave. Lord, I thank you for the very power of the blood of Jesus that's greater. Lord, I thank you for salvation. Lord, that our, that our, our faith is in him. Our faith is in the living God. Our faith is in Jesus this morning. And Lord, I thank you for, Lord, not only delivering us from sin and forgiving sin, but Lord, for making us new creations in Christ. We're so thankful, Lord, 
thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that we're no longer dead in our sins, but we're alive to Christ. And Father, we celebrate today. We honor today. We love you today, Jesus. And once again, we just give our lives to you. We freely surrender our lives to you. And we thank you. We honor you. We love you today. And we give you glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So if you need ministry, if you need prayer, come and receive this morning. And uh, we just bless you guys. Thank you for coming today. Have a great day. Enjoy your family. And we'll see you. God bless.